Well, most of you know who our speaker is today, Keith Swenson, who's been the president of Design Science Association for many years. But I have a few more things that maybe you didn't know. So um, he has been mainly writing articles for the creation community on biological responses to the 1980 eruption, emphasizing the likelihood that what happened at Mount St. Helens provides insight into the healing of the earth following the global cataclysm of Noah's flood. Um, his most recent articles have been published in Journal of Creation, which is currently online, but that is the part of the Creation Ministries International in Australia. His topics have included arthropod response to the eruption of Mount St. Helens, amphibian responses to the eruption, and phenicoid fungi, first responders at Mount St. Helens. In past years, he's wrote for the Creation Magazine on the Pine Creek Boulder, radiometric dating of the Lava Dome, and biological recovery. In addition, he's also authored a monograph on biological recovery that was used for the Institute for Creation Research's their tours here at Mount St. Helens. So let's welcome Keith Swenson, and thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marianne. It's good to be here this morning. Beautiful weather out there. Typical Oregon day, isn't it? Well, this uh, morning we want to go back to the topic of the season. Uh, every year in May we come up with Mount St. Helens as the anniversaries click by. This talk was designed to be given two years ago, but uh, didn't quite get around to it at that point, so this is a um, little, bit, little bit out of sync, but not bad. The topic is discovering the hidden world of Mount St. Helens. And those of you who have a chemistry background might recognize this man. His name is Dmitry Mendeleev, and he was the Russian chemistry professor who developed this the periodic table of the elements, which is a chart, an iconic chart that hangs in, I think, every chemistry lab in the world, probably. And as with many founders of modern science, Mendeleev firmly believed the Bible. And his favorite verse was Proverbs 25.2, which reads, it is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings to search things out. And Mendeleev saw chemistry as a royal and godly pursuit, and he successfully discovered the concealed or hidden order inherent in the chemical elements placed there by God. Now, the title of um, today's program suggests a similar enterprise at Mount St. Helens. Uh, the ecosystems at the mountain uh, have appeared to be designed with an inherent ability to recover from catastrophic disturbance. Um, and today we will look at some of the heretofore hidden mechanisms which have been discovered and uh, mechanisms by which this recovery is occurring. Well, here's what uh, Mount St. Helens looked like uh, before the eruption. Many of you remember this, I'm sure. Beautiful 9,677-foot snow-clad volcanic cone surrounded by an expansive forest and of course, we see Spirit Lake in the foreground here. And on May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens experienced this cataclysmic eruption that I think most of us are familiar with. And the eruption consisted of several volcanic events, which I'm not going over in detail, but just to mention them. Initially, there was a, an earthquake, and then a huge landslide, or sometimes called a debris avalanche, occurred followed by a sideways or lateral blast by the mountain over the landscape to the north. Kind of an unexpected event. And then there was a vertical eruption that uh, dropped ash, or also called tephra, for nine hours. And there was also a giant wave, or perhaps waves, that emanated out of Spirit Lake onto the mountains to the north of the lake. And mud flows, also called lahars, traveled down the rivers that drained Mount St. Helens. And the final event uh, listed here is hot ash or pyroclastic flows, which came down out of the mountain and buried uh, deeply the area just north of the volcano. 
And so all these events together produce what we commonly call the blast zone today. And here is, uh, and, and the, the blast zone is 230 uh, square miles, and uh, much of it was produced within minutes. And this uh, is a photograph showing p just a little part of the blast zone, but I think it's an amazing photograph. Just look at all those trees that have been, been uh, felled. Some loggers did call this the biggest clear cut in the world. Uh, here we see a map of the blast zone. And as you can see from the color coding, again, I'm not going into detail here, but just from the color coding, you can see the blast zone is not uniform. It's not the same all over. But it's rather a mosaic, uh, um, which has been formed by these various events and processes uh, on May 18th and thereafter. Well, four decades, actually 42 years, have now passed since this big eruption, during which Mount St. Helens, the ecosystem, has been progressively recovering. That is, reassembling itself, as seen here at Lahar Overlook on the southeast side of the mountain. And here's a jigsaw puzzle of Mount St. Helens, and it can serve as an analogy for us. The puzzle um, represented, um, by, represents the Mount St. Helens ecosystem, and it consists of many interconnected pieces. The volcano disrupted that ecosystem, similar to the puzzle pieces being scattered, separated and scattered randomly. And then over the last 40 years, the ecosystem has been reassembling and continues to do so today as represented by this partially completed puzzle. So in this program, uh, we're going to look at 10 examples of organisms and mechanisms responsible for rebuilding the Mount St. Helens landscape. Uh, and as we do, I want you to consider these three questions. First of all, is the Mount St. Helens ecosystem designed, actually, to recover from disturbance. Somewhat like the human body is designed to heal after an injury. Secondly, does recovery at Mount St. Helens help us understand global recovery following Noah's flood? And thirdly, do lessons at Mount St. Helens enable us to become better stewards of God's creation? Uh, one um, brief explanation uh, we talk a lot about recovery here, and I know when you talk to the ecologists at Mount St. Helens, they'll say, no, no don't use that word. Uh, but yet I find they do also. Uh, at Mount St. Helens, we have biological responses to the eruption, and these do not necessarily produce the same uh, landscape that was there before the eruption. Recovery suggests it goes back to what it was, but you may have a forest that becomes a wetland or a forest uh, before and now it's a, it's a meadow. So, uh, but I'll use the term recovery because I think we, we understand that uh, probably better. Well, in ecology, the destruction of an ecosystem such as what happened at Mount St. Helens is called a disturbance. Defined here simply as any process that, that disrupts an ecosystem. That would include fire, like forest fire, wind, flooding, disease, volcanic eruption, and all kinds of other things. And remarkably, a disturbance immediately initiates a suite of processes, which we call succession, or again, we might say recovery for simplicity. Succession is defined as the development of plant and animal communities following a disturbance, and we'll use these terms. A human analogy might be a multi-car pileup on the freeway, a disturbance, which promptly initiates an emergency response led by the first responders. So who or what, then, were the first responders at Mount St. Helens? Well, Fred Swanson is a geomorphologist, geologist, and he worked on the landslide deposit, that debris avalanche deposit, north of Mount St. Helens, just uh, 10 days uh, after the eruption. He was up there on May 28, 1980. And he was digging little holes in uh, the deposits, as geologists are inclined to do, and he noticed something that puzzled him. And to quote uh, uh, a, an account of the event, it says, there were these little spider-like threads in the holes, he says, nearly invisible. 
Well, Swanson saw these little spider-like threads uh, flitting around in the breezes. He had no idea what they were. He didn't understand what they were. Uh, but he later learned. And these were fungal filaments. Uh, fungal filaments are called hyphae. We'll use that term a few times, I think, here in this talk. And they were hyphae of so-called phenicoid or burn site fungi. That is, there are fungi that lie dormant in the soil, uh, and they only start growing after a heat stimulus. And around here, that's usually a forest fire, but they're not picky, and in this case, it was a volcanic eruption that, uh, that caused them to become active. And this term phenicoid was actually a term coined at Mount St. Helens, and it refers to the mythical phoenix bird that was reborn repeatedly out of the ashes. You may be familiar with that story. So then, in just 10 days, the fungi that Swanson observed had formed a living web of near-microscopic-sized filaments spread throughout the volcanic ash that covered the debris avalanche. I'm not saying the whole blast zone, but it was only studied in, the, in a certain place, the debris avalanche. Now here's a photomicrograph, about a thousand magnification, showing uh, fungal hyphae. And you can easily see the filaments there, and they're made of fungal cells attached end to end. And then you can also see the round uh, little bodies, which are reproductive spores. Well, Swanson called his discovery then the first biological response to the eruption, the fungi being the first responders. But you might ask, what were these little filaments doing? Were they doing anything important, for example? And to answer that question, let me read a quote from a journal, Forest Ecology and Management, and it reads as follows, and then I'll break this down if you don't get everything as we go along, but um, it says the mycelial, meaning fungal, mats, appeared to play an important functional role on site, possibly aggregating soil particles in otherwise highly erodible landscapes. We hypothesize that fungi, such as the ones known as anthrocobia, are pivotal species in early system recovery after disturbance, helping minimize the movement of soil in the absence of plant roots. Other functional roles of post-fire fungi might include nutrient acquisition leading to the reestablishment of vegetation. Okay, maybe that flew partly over your head, I don't know. Uh, I said a lot there, but let me just break it down now as to what was included in that quote. It says <clears throat> that first of all, these fungal filaments help stabilize ash and reduce erosion. And the hyphae, in other words, acted like microscopic rebar going through these loose volcanic deposits. Secondly, the hyphae aggregator, they, they tied ash particles together in little bundles, which produced little pore spaces between the bundles. And so those pore spaces then aided the aeration of soil, or the developing soil, and it uh, aided the infiltration of water into the developing soil. Also, the fungi decomposed organic materials, which is what they normally do. There were leaves, wood fragments, and other things in the ash deposits, and the uh, fungi decomposed those, releasing their, their nutrients, uh, which had been bound up in those materials. It released those nutrients into the ash. And then the fungi themselves incorporated those nutrients into themselves to build up their own fungal bodies, and it took in, for example, nitrogen. And eventually, these fungi form surface mats of fungal material, like little mushrooms and so forth, which subsequently then became colonized by photosynthetic organisms, like algae and mosses, and later regular vascular plants and so forth. So the, where the fungi were, there were little islands of re plant recovery very early on. So this whole scenario then suggests that uh, the ecosystem at Mount St. Helens is programmed to rebound rapidly from major disturbance, like maybe somebody thought it through ahead of time. Well, what was Fred Swanson's reaction to this discovery? Well, he was pretty impressed, too. He wrote or said that it was an afternoon that ranks right up there with the birth of my children. It was just so amazing and interesting. 
spoken like a true scientist, but I do wonder what his wife, or I believe partner, thought about this comment. Uh, now, as Marianne mentioned, I've been putting together articles for the Journal of Creation, and there is one on phenicoid fungi, first responders at Mount St. Helens, that if you're interested in this subject, uh, if you are a mycologist at heart, uh, it'll give you a lot more detail and the references and, and so forth. So uh, that's uh, available uh, online uh, at creation.com. Well, so that's the first responders. Let's move on to our second topic. Uh, following the eruption, many scientists predicted that the return of insects to the blast zone would be extremely slow. Note this quote from botanist A.B. Adams. Uh, he uh, said that there seemed to be justification to believe that it would be impossible for insects to recover at all. I mean, bugs of all things, why wouldn't they return? Uh, well, this may be a bit of an overstatement, but there was good reason for this concern because fresh, dry, volcanic ash acts as a natural insecticide. Uh, first of all, what is volcanic ash? Well, it's not something that's been burned. Uh, rather, it can be defined as fine fragments of volcanic rock that have been blasted into the atmosphere and then eventually settled on the ground. Mount St. Helens erupted for nine hours on May 18th, sending ash to over, well over 70,000 feet. And some of it was carried by upper level winds and traveled uh, around the earth, and in two weeks, uh, some of it actually returned to Mount St. Helens. I remember bumper stickers uh, uh, in, in that time, and they said, don't come to Washington this summer, Washington is coming to you. So some of you maybe saw those. Well, in the blast zone, of course, the falling ash left a th thick deposit of ash on everything, including all of the exposed bugs. So what was the effect on arthropods? Now, arthropods, I mean at Mount St. Helens, the insects, the spiders, and the millipedes. Those are the three big categories. So what happened to them? Well, it turns out that the, uh, the ash abrades the waxy cuticle of the exoskeleton, causing water loss. You know, we have an internal skeleton, but uh, arthropods have an external skeleton and it's covered by a waxy layer that keeps the water in, so the organisms don't uh, uh, desiccate and die. Uh, but the ash removed that, and that was part of the reason it acts as an insecticide. In fact, if, I, I know I got rid of some carpenter ants by using diatomaceous earth in our house, and that's the same principle. Also, the, um, the uh, ash clogs or digest digestive tracts, and it clogs their respiratory spiracles, or the pores through which the, they breathe. And they um, use excessive salivation, or they lose a lot of water just by trying to clean the ash off themselves. Those are the main mechanisms that were involved. Here's simply an example. Here's a arthropod uh, that you may recognize if you hike our forests. This is a yellow-spotted millipede. They're on the trail frequently. I, there's actually a better name for it, I think. Some people have called it the night train millipede. It's supposed to look like a, a train in the black of night, and all you see is the light through the windows. I think that fits very nicely. But anyways, uh, the, um, this is a quote now from researchers Edwards and Sugg, entomologists. Uh, and it says this, one dramatic die-off among pedestrian taxa, that is the bugs that walk, was noted in the vicinity of Ryan Lake in September 1980. That's about 12 miles north of Mount St. Helens. And they noticed innumerable dead millipedes of the genus Harpaphy, which is the one I just showed you. And they were found in, in the blowdown zone. These millipedes are important litter consumers, and they died with their guts packed with ash ingested as they attempted to feed on ash-covered litter. Well, how's that significant? Well. Certainly after the eruption, there was a big um, concern that we would have beetle, bark beetle outbreaks in the blast zone that would probably spread to um, other uh, parts of the forest. There were Douglas fir beetles they were concerned about and silver fir beetles and such. And these might spread out of the blast zone into the surrounding forests. Well, 
The issue was used by the U.S. Forest Service and certainly the timber industry as well as an argument for rapidly salvage logging everything uh, that was, had been blown down. Forest ecologists, on the other hand, argued strongly against that, saying it would re greatly retard recovery. And so there was quite a debate about that. Here is a, just a distinctive marking of bark beetles. Uh, this is the, the outer bark's been removed, and you see these galleries where the, where the insects live, and they, and they lay their eggs and produce uh, larvae, and, and they uh, grow up in these uh, unique uh, appearing uh, galleries that you see when you remove the bark of uh, dead trees oftentimes. Well, what really did happen? And here's a quote uh, from, uh, from a researcher at Mount St. Helens says, in retrospect, it is apparent that no management action was necessary to avert insect outbreaks because the Mount St. Helens ash was a potent natural insecticide that caused rapid insect mortality by de disrupting their ability to maintain water balance, just what we talked about. So the Mount St. Helens ecosystem had, it turns out, a built-in mechanism by which runaway insect infestations were prevented. If you're interested in bugs, here's the second article, uh, Arthropod Responses to the 1980 Eruption of Mount St. Helens, and especially Implications for Noahic Flood Recovery. It talks about this, but many other things related to arthropods. Well, um, our next topic is this one, the first colonizers of the pumice plain. So what exactly is the pumice plain? Well, this is a pre-eruption view looking north from Mount St. Helens. And the X marks the location of the future pumice plain. Before the eruption, this was a beautiful old growth forest, a spectacular forest. You can also see Spirit Lake there. That's Mount Rainier in the distance. Now, listed here are the impacts suffered by this site uh, during the eruption. It was buried by hundreds of feet of debris avalanche deposits. It was blasted by that initial sideways eruption. It was totally sterilized by 1,700 degree Fahrenheit pyroclastic flows, and it was covered by nine hours of ash fall. And here's the result. If you, if you miss the difference, there's before and there's after. And so that site, which was a haven of life, an old growth forest, now is a sterile wasteland supporting absolutely no living organisms, not even bacteria. Because of the temperatures involved, nothing living could have survived. Even these heat-loving bacteria would not have made it. Um, of course, much life. I'm not saying that all life was extinguished in the blast zone. That absolutely was not the case. You go beyond the pumice plain here, there was life uh, remaining in great quantity, what's called biological legacies, the life that uh, did survive. Now, the surface of this pumice plain looks like this, and it's called desert pavement. Uh, the, cor the coarse material remains here, and much of the fine material has been blown away by the frequent winds that this area experiences. Uh, so this volcanic material, actually, uh, it may be good in making soil, and it is, and, and it makes soil more productive, but it doesn't contain the nutrients that are needed. It has no carbon, of course, no nitrogen, and no readily available sulfur. All of these are things required by plants. Now, here's a broader view of the pumice plain. Not a very inviting site. And so recovery here must occur by what's called primary succession. And primary succession is defined as the colonization by organisms of a surface that has never previously supported life. For example, the lava flows in, in Hawaii that we're, we see frequently. Uh, the lava flows out as, as orange uh, glowing material. It solidifies to black basalt. And that basalt surface is a surface that never has supported life. But yet life eventually does come in and take over. Uh, and that process, again, again is primary succession. And you can compare it to the term secondary succession, which is a much more common thing, which is a colonization by organisms 
of a surface that contains biological legacies from the disturbance of a previous living community, typically uh, like a forest fire. Uh, a forest fire goes through an area, is all life extinguished? Oh, absolutely not. There are living trees, there are <coughs> roots in the ground, there are seeds, there are uh, all kinds of things that survive. And so that, that, those are biological legacies, and that makes it secondary succession, which is more rapid, of course, than primary succession. Now, <coughs> here's a test question for you, and uh, I'll ask you to raise your hands when I get done, when I go through these, but uh, what organisms would you think, or do you think, first successfully colonized that sterile pumice plain where there was no, nothing remaining? What would be the first thing to actually successfully colonize, live there and reproduce and so forth? Would it be the phenicoid fungi I mentioned? Maybe mosses and lichens, that would make some sense maybe. Of course, weeds, that's always an idea, sun-loving weedy plants. Maybe pocket gophers uh, that burrow in the ground. Predatory beetles, eh, I don't know. How many vote for phenicoid fungi? Anybody? Yeah, okay. How about mosses and lichens? Oh yeah, I got a couple there. How about weeds? Weeds are more, a little more popular. Pocket gophers? Oh yeah, that's good. And predatory beetles? Nobody? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, well the answer is predatory beetles. You're all wrong. <laughs> Don't feel bad, the ecologists were all wrong too. <clears throat> it's interesting, I mean, they were really wrong, and they freely admit this. Uh, the prevailing dogma at the time of the eruption was the old idea that in, in a destroyed landscape, recovery comes from the outside and advances inward and takes over. And so they were expecting that to happen with the blast zone. However, the first helicopter trip that went in there found plants coming up all over the place. So they realized that life had not been extinguished in there. Life, much life had survived. And so they had to rethink their uh, basic uh, premises uh, quite radically. But anyways, going back to the pumice plain, predatory beetles were the first colonizers. Well, the phenicoid fungi, the mosses and lichens, the weeds, and the pocket gophers would, of course, all been destroyed. They would not have been there as biological legacies. They would have to come in from the side somehow, and it would take time. Well, same is true for the beetles. So how did this work out? Well, the group of beetles that we're talking about um, is of the family Carabidae. They're ground beetles. And um, the, um, there's an important concept uh, which is called arthropod fallout, or if you like, bug fall. Uh, during summer months at Mount St. Helens, but everywhere else also, when the arthropods are most active, many are carried by the winds and travel great distances. And eventually they fall to the ground, either alive or maybe dead. And this constitutes the arthropod fallout. It's a rain of live and dead insects, spiders, and so forth from the atmosphere, of course, primarily during the summer months. And most of this live fallout in the blast zone, well, they actually died. Was, conditions were too harsh. A few species lived, but they failed to reproduce. However, the one group that not only lived, but successfully reproduced was the ground beetles, the family Carabidae, particularly this one, who goes by the name of Bembidium planatum. You've probably heard of him, I suspect. <clears throat> I don't think it has a common name as far as I know. It's just Bembidium planatum, but there are many other species similar. And it is a specialist <coughs> in disturbed habitats. And at Mount St. Helens, it felt right at home. So it became the first successful colonizer of the pumice plain. You might say, um, on such a sterile environment, what did it feed, it feed on? What did it eat? And the answer is simple. Bambidian consumed exclusively its fellow arthropod fallout companions. It ate dead and live bugs. Now here's another important term. Uh, an aeolian zone, an aeolian zone, which is a habitat in which resident organisms depend solely on inputs from the atmosphere, from wind uh, transporting materials. Uh, so that's an Elolian zone, and 
that's what we saw at Mount St. Helens. That's uh, what fed the initial colonizers. And that's uh, how they got in there in the first place. Now, Edwards and Sugg, entomologists, said this. This pattern, that is of an aeolian zone, is a widespread and perhaps a general one for terrestrial primary successional habitats. We propose that comparable pioneer predatory and scavenging arthropods operate around the entire Pacific Ring of Fire and other volcanic areas, wherever volcanic activity produces new surfaces. I mean, these are the colonizers of uh, volcanic surfaces. Should not statements like these cause us to wonder uh, whether Aeolian communities perhaps pioneered new volcanic surfaces following the global disturbance of Noah's flood? one of the mechanisms of recovery. Likely that is the case. Well, let's move on. We just learned uh, that these barren uh, uh, pumice plain deposits lack the nutrients required by plants, particularly nitrogen. So what was needed were, would be some uh, fertilizer factories, such as this plant. Uh, you may recognize this. Anybody know what this is? It's a lupin. It's a, specifically a prairie lupin. It's a high elevation lupin, uh, low to the ground, tolerates the winds up there. But uh, this uh, plant uh, uh, is, is like all lupins, a legume. It's in the pea family of plants, and it's able to fix nitrogen. So what does that mean? Well, our, nit our atmosphere consists of 70% nitrogen, so there's plenty of it around. But plants are not able to use nitrogen from the air, N2. They can't use it in its gaseous form. What plants need is nitrogen-containing compounds such as ammonia and such. Uh, in other words, they need sort of a fertilizer form of nitrogen. Now here's another uh, uh, lupin, much bigger, taller one that grows there as well. It's uh, called broadleaf lupin. It also fixes nitrogen. And lupins fix nitrogen, not that it's broken, that sounds like it, what it means, but what they do is they um, have nodules on their roots, and these nodules are homes for certain specialized bacteria that live in the nodules, called rhizobium, and these bacteria are able to take nitrogen from the atmosphere and convert it into chemicals, compounds that plants are able to use. Plants by themselves can't fix nitrogen. They have to partner up with certain bacteria, and only certain plants are able to do that. So why actually do they need nitrogen? Plant? Why do plants need nitrogen? Well, it's pretty important stuff, it turns out, because nitrogen um, is in the amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. Also, it's found in nucleic acids, uh, so your DNA and RNA contains uh, nitrogen. It's essential for all life. Well, besides the lupins, the other major nitrogen-fixing plants at Mount St. Helens are alders. And there's two species of alders at Mount St. Helens, the red alder at lower elevation and the sitka alder at high elevation. And both are very uh, fast-growing, pioneering, uh, deciduous trees or shrubs that they quickly take over vast areas. This is a mountain uh, right off the trail that leads to Spirit Lake. If you go to Spirit Lake, you hike right by this. And it's uh, essentially totally covered with Sitka alder. There's some conifers that are taking root on the flat area below, but uh, the mountain is, is strictly alder. All of that alder is pumping in nitrogen into those, those deposits on that mountain. Now, um, dense stands of red alder at lower elevation like this also blanket huge areas, the whole sides of mountains and so forth. Um, this are, is a picture of uh, the nodules on the roots of alder. They're fairly good size. And you can see the, the bumpy things there. Those are nodules that bacteria live within. And this is um, a different bacterium named Frankia, different than the rhizobium in the lupin, but does the same sort of work. And finally, this slide here shows the formation of soil. There's Sitka alder. And so you can see uh, the volcanic rock here is weathering and producing the mineral component of soil. Uh, this volcanic rock breaks down eventually to basically clay, 
And the alder leaves are decomposing and adding carbon and nitrogen compounds to that developing soil. And so the result will be a, a substrate or a soil that will be capable of, of supporting conifer trees and other forest plants and so forth. Well, along the same line, let's move on to another one called fungal extenders for plant roots. Um, this also has to do with soils. And as we, <coughs> as we all know, <coughs> me, plants have roots as shown on the left side, uh, but plants also have extenders that reach far beyond these roots. And they are seen on the right. And they consist of fungal hyphae. There's that word again. And they, these hyphae attach to the root tips of a plant and extend much further than the roots. Now, such uh, fungi are called mycorrhizal fungi. And the, uh, uh, in Greek, uh, myco means fungus and rhiza is root, so the term means fungus roots. Here's an, a scanning electron micrograph showing uh, two root tips, uh, the bigger structures in there, and attached to them are all these fungal filaments that are extending in all directions out into the soil. So these are mycorrhizal fungi. Here's a, a stained slide, the microscope section, a cross uh, section of a root, and you can see the cells you can see there's some nuclei in there, but there's a lot of purple round bodies within cells, and those are actually fungal hyphae that have penetrated into the root cells themselves. And so those are, again, mycorrhizal fungi. The cell, cells contain the end of the fungus, but it also extends way out into the, into the surrounding land. Um, so many of the mushrooms that you see when you go hiking in the woods in the fall, for example, are the fruiting bodies of these mycorrhizal fungi that are living underground in, uh, in the forest, for example. This is one called Amethyst leucaria. Here we see a Rusula species pushing around the forest floor, and here's another one pushing its way through the forest floor litter. Here's a coral fungus, beautiful fungus. And all of these have mycorrhizal connections with the forest trees. So how does that work? How does this connection between a fungus and the trees work? Well, the, um, what does it really accomplish, let's say? Well, first of all, the fungus penetrates and explores the forest soil up to tens of meters from the plant, great distances, really and it transports water and nutrients back to the host plant. And those nutrients might include nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and many other things needed by plants. And then in return, the plant supplies the fungus with sugars, uh, which are produced through photosynthesis. And that's important because fungi can't photosynthesize. They have to get their food from someplace else. And the plants provide it in this situation. So this is both a um, symbiosis in that it's, a, and it's also a mutualism. A symbiosis is a close living association between two species, and a mutualism is when both species benefit. The fungus benefits and the trees benefit. It's a win-win situation. So how common are these mycorrhizal associations? Um, it's been learned in recent years, been a lot of study on this, that the vast majority of plants on Earth are partnered with soil fungi. That is, there are thousands of species of fungi associated with nearly 300,000 species of plants. And that includes most plant life in Northwest forests, and as far as I know, all of our conifer and hardwood trees are dependent on this connection with fungi. So the importance of mycorrhizal fungi in northwest forests can hardly be overemphasized. Simply put, without the fungal connection, we wouldn't have our forests, or we wouldn't have them, at least as we see them today in a, the healthy state. Uh, when they plant trees and deprive them of the fungal connection, the, the plants are often stunted, for example. So therefore, it would seem now at Mount St. Helens, the reestablishment of these mycorrhizae following the eruption would be of utmost importance. There was a problem, however, 
as shown in this diagram. After the eruption, the surviving fungi and spores were buried in the old soil at the bottom. That was covered by inches to feet of volcanic debris. And then seeds dispersed by the wind or by it coming in from animals and so forth ended up on the sterile surface of the volcanic material, totally separated from the fungal uh, propagules. So what was really needed was some kind of an excavator, something to bring up that old, old soil and along with it, its complement of spores and hyphae and, and seeds and so forth. And of course, here's our excavator right here. And this is the northern pocket gopher. Many of the pocket gophers survived the eruption because they are fossorial animals. They live in burrows underground. And they were sheltered. They probably didn't, hardly knew that the eruption occurred, I suppose. Maybe they felt a little shaking of the ground. But anyways, they, following the eruption, they dug out of their burrows, they came to the surface, and they, they brought with them mounds of the old soil, along with the fungi and seeds and roots and all kinds of things. And so the gopher mounds became little oases in the barren pumice deposits where plants recovered first. Uh, and the gopher himself be <coughs> became quite a hero in the recovery story. In fact, had a book written about him uh, children's book, Gopher to the Rescue, a Volcano Recovery Story. I've read it. It's quite good. I kind of like that drawing of the gopher, too. It's neat. So. Okay. Let's move on. Um, our next topic is grazers of the canopy. You'll love this one. Here's what I'm referring to. What are they? Yeah, western tent caterpillars. Um, hmm. The uh, reason for this caterpillar's name is that these, they build these tent-like structures, which you've all seen, I'm sure, and they use them for thermal regulation and protection from predators, especially from birds and so forth. And the caterpillars uh, spread themselves out uh, from their home, and uh, they forage particularly on leaves, and it's particularly red and Sitka alder at Mount St. Helens that they like. And when they are mature, the larvae build these white cottony uh, cocoons, <coughs> and within these they metamorphose to moths. Here's an adult moth, and below it is encircling the stem of this plant, the egg mass that she has laid. Uh, the eggs will usually overwinter and hatch as tiny caterpillars in the spring, and so their life cycle continues. Well, tent caterpillars <coughs> exhibit boom and bust population cycles. They are usually present in small to moderate numbers, but every several years their populations explode. We've probably all seen that. They uh, result in sometimes near or completely near defoliation of trees, particularly alder trees, over huge areas, huge areas. You can see the uh, trees here are pretty much defoliated, and you can see the tents uh, very readily. Well, 2012 was a boom year for tent caterpillars at Mount St. Helens. I recall being up there, I believe, with Steve Haley and Ruth Hazen, and we were walking around, and they found these caterpillars were everywhere. And uh, one reporter described it this way. They're everywhere up here, and they brought the elements of an insect horror movie to the upper Toodle Valley. The hummocks trail near Coldwater Lake is speckled with their, their fuzzy brown bodies, and you can't help squashing them by the dozen if you hike the terrain northwest of Mount St. Helens. <clears throat> They've turned the trunks of trees into wiggling, squirming masses. If you briefly stand still, several will creep up your boots and legs. Interpretive signs and kiosks are curtained with their writhing bodies, and if you stand silent, you can hear them munching away at the leaves of red alder trees. I thought of bringing some for our table back there, but I couldn't find any. Uh, now here's another quote. This one from our own Caitlin Labar. Uh, the, you know Caitlin, she's our butterfly expert. And she's describing caterpillars near Kelso Longview. She said this, I noticed, she was riding her bicycle, I noticed caterpillars covering the road in bushes, and then realized many of the alder trees along the forest road were nearly defoliated. When I stood quietly and listened, it sounded like it was raining even though there were no clouds in the sky. It was the sound of all the droppings of millions of caterpillars falling through the trees and bushes. Gross, but fascinating. 
Caitlin's not here, is she? Um, well, all of this might make you wonder if someone should have done something about the caterpillar explosion, like maybe bug bomb the blast zone. But was that really necessary, or would it be wise? After all, this is a native species, not an invader. And possibly, and the question was, has been raised, could the caterpillar hordes actually be doing things that are beneficial to the forest ecosystem and furthering the recovery process? Listed here are some potentially positive things about tent caterpillars, not all proven totally, but, but reasonable ideas and with evidence to support them. And first of all, the tent caterpillars do control the alder populations, which really take over. You know, and you can say, well, what do I call a plant species that lacks controls over its growth and spread? And there's nothing that eats it. It doesn't have any competitors or few parasites or diseases. What do you call a plant like that? And I think uh, you generally would call it an invasive species, because an invasive species is often something came in from Europe or Asia, and it didn't bring with it its controlling organism. So it it's grows in an un unfettered fashion. And so the fact that the caterpillars help control alder growth is probably a good thing in the ecosystem. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> the droppings and carcasses from masses of tent caterpillars fall, and they enrich the soil. Think of them as little packages of nitrogen-rich fertilizer. And alder uh, produces uh, a very dense, closed canopy and lets very little light into the forest floor. And defoliation of the canopy opens up the canopy and lets in a lot of light. And so you combine the nutrient pulse and the increased light, and you produce a growth spurt of forest floor plants, including the conifer seedlings that are getting started down there. And ecologists um, believe at Mount St. Helens and elsewhere that repeated episodes of defoliation by tent caterpillars likely accelerates the conversion of alder forests to conifer forests, and then that would be a positive thing. Uh, here's a quote from a study in eastern Canada with different species, but the same idea. Multiple years of defoliation likely cause more rapid canopy transition from aspen to fir. And finally, uh, tent caterpillars um, uh, provide abundant food for birds, and at night they produce abundant food for bats, and of course birds and bats widely disperse caterpillar and moth nutrients throughout the recovering area. Well, this is Dr. John Bishop. He's a biology professor at Washington State University in Vancouver and a researcher at Mount St. Helens. I had a pleasure of spending a day in the field with him a few years ago. And Dr. Bishop's research focuses on the interactions between insects and plants. So in addition to studying tent caterpillars, he's studied various things, as we see here. And what he finds is that many of the plants at Mount St. Helens sort of took over and, and just proliferated greatly until a certain insect established and then brought that plant under control. And this seems to have happened over and over again. The first thing he studied, and you may have heard about it, is that the willows along the streams were just growing like crazy until a stem-boring weevil or beetle entered, and that made the, uh, the leaves, the twigs, break more easily. Essentially, it pruned the alder, the bug did. And then there are similar insects that have been hypothesized for various other plants as controls on those plants. Well, <clears throat> let's do one more, and I think we're about to do it for a break then. <clears throat> uh, let's look at snorkelers in Spirit Lake. Here's the pumice plain again in Spirit Lake and Mount Rainier. And recall that all life was destroyed on the pumice plain, no biological legacies. Also remember that initially, these pumice deposits lacked the nutrients needed by plants. And finally, notice here that the pumice plain forms the south shore of Spirit Lake. The pumice plain and Spirit Lake are side by side. Here's a quote from uh, researchers Edwards and Sugg uh, concerning the pumice plain. Edwards and Sugg, they said, the total carbon 
organic carbon, and total nitrogen content of 1980 samples of pyroclastic flow materials, that is pumice plain materials, were reported as zero. And so the nutrients weren't there. Now in contrast to the pumice plain, <coughs> Following the eruption, Spirit Lake was loaded with nutrients. Why? Because the charred remains of a huge old growth forest had been dumped into its waters and was decomposing. And the waters were just black and bubbling and bacteria were really happy and numerous and so forth. The nutrient contents of the lake water skyrocketed, dissolved phosphorus, increased 80 times pre-eruption levels. Integrated nitrogen uh, went up 50 times beyond pre-eruption levels. So with all those nutrients, uh, you would think that there would be organisms taking advantage of them, uh, and indeed there were. Here's a quote. It says, the soup, which is referring to the waters of Spirit Lake, that's sort of what it was, the soup uh, provided the substrate for massive bacterial blooms during the first two years after the eruption. In Spirit Lake, those blooms reached the extraordinary figure of nearly a half billion cells, that is bacterial cells, per milliliter. That's likely a record in the, in the annals of environmental microbiology, I understand. And so this diagram depicts, depicts the situation. We have nutrient-rich Spirit Lake side by side with nutrient deficient pumice plain, it would seem that a nutrient transferring organism would be very useful here. However, there was a really big problem. There's some bacteria. The big problem was the hordes of bacteria in the waters of Spirit Lake quickly used up all the oxygen in the lake's water. So the organisms, uh, other organisms that require oxygen, which is just about everything, couldn't live there. And so really no organism could really successfully live in Spirit Lake except these bacteria. Oh, and there's one exception. And there he is, the mosquito. Now, th this is a mosquito larva. And notice the protruding tube. This is a siphon or a snorkel. And so in contrast to most aquatic insect larvae, which get their oxygen out of the water, the mosquito larvae get their oxygen from the air. They rise to the surface and they breathe atmospheric air oxygen. And so they thrived in Spirit Lake, feasting on the anaerobic microbes. Here we see some mosquito larvae at the top of a, a water container there, and they've got their siphon out, getting their oxygen from the atmosphere. So once mosquito larvae in Spirit Lake metamorphosed into adults, they dispersed over the sterile pumice plain, and eventually they died. And their nutrient-rich carcasses then kept con continuously releasing Spirit Lake nutrients into the sterile volcanic deposits. Uh, again, the researchers Edwards and Sugg described this as a striking example of nutrient redistribution at the landscape level. So it appears, then, that mosquitoes, you know, like tent caterpillars, ground beetles, weevils, grasshoppers, soil fungi, pocket gophers, and a host of other things, are really uh, valuable components of the recovery of the ecosystem. Not one of, most of them do sort of a small thing, but you put them all together, that's what causes recovery, is all of these, these uh, organisms and processes. And so you might call all these creatures, uh, if you, you know, you might call them heroes, uh, like the pocket gopher was called a hero. You now you can call the mosquito and the cat tent caterpillar a hero if you like. Now you may not want to do that, but uh, that's, uh, that's up to you. Um, we'll take a break here, but look, before you run off, uh, I want to mention that we have a display table at the back, and we have uh, some biological things, and Steve Haley will show you, including a live organism that I'll talk about in the, in the second part of this talk. And you can look at, look at him. And uh, there's some other interesting things. And I have an article that's available if you want to take your own trip to Mount St. Helens, or uh, it's an article that we use when we take people to the east side of the mountain. It's a road log which describes exactly where you go and what you see at each spot and what you can look at while you're driving between spots. So you can take a look at that. And uh, uh, also uh, mention that um, I think Marianne mentioned we do have a, uh, a um, east side Mount St. Helens tour on July 14th. 
If it should be full, or I know people have signed up, I'd urge you to put your name on the waiting list because if that list gets long enough, we could possibly add on a second trip. I'm not sure yet, but uh, let us know if you're, if you're interested. So I think uh, with that, we'll... I have a couple of books here. These are totally secular books. I think they're of interest if you're interested in Mount St. Helens. So I'll just mention them. Uh, one is called A Hero on Mount St. Helens, The Life and Legacy of David A. Johnston. He, of course, was a geologist was, that was killed in the eruption, and the uh, Johnston Ridge Observatory is named in honor of him. And this is written by a uh, friend of the family who knows about it. And it's really interesting about his life and uh, why he did what he did. Uh, just one little, <coughs> one little episode. He, uh, as a kid, lived through the uh, Oaklawn tornado, which in Illinois was a big one. Lot, ki lots of people killed, lots of big disaster. His, his mother and, was in the newspaper business, I believe. And so he got out and he saw all of that. And it was that that probably drove, steered him to a career in volcanology with the idea of being able to mitigate and to lessen the danger of volcanoes by being able to warn people and develop uh, systems of knowing when a, a volcano would erupt. And so that was what he was studying. Uh, so the other one is called After the Blast, Ecological Recovery of Mount St. Helens by Eric Wagner. He's a biologist. And he writes the story of the biological studies done at Mount St. Helens. Uh, again, uh, it's well done. It's uh, accurate, I think, and uh, it's, a, it's a secular book, but then again, the story, it doesn't, you know, it's the same as what a creationist would tell about the story of, uh, of what was actually accomplished at the mountain. So if you want to read something, After the Blast by Eric Wagner, or A Hero on Mount St. Helens, it was written by Melanie Holmes. I have the books up here if you want to look at them after we're done. <coughs> Well, let's go on to our last little bit here. And our next topic is switch hitting salamanders. Now, most salamanders, and I should mention we have one in the back here. In fact, we have the one you see here in the back. Most salamanders in the blast zone died during the eruption, but there were also survivors, many of which were still hibernating in the muddy bottoms of ice-covered ponds and lakes because this was in the spring and it was fairly high elevation. For example, many northwestern salamanders, similar to this one, uh, survived. But surviving salamanders faced a very daunting challenge. Part of their habitat, the surrounding forest, was now inhospitable. It was a pumice wasteland. So these are amphibious creatures. They require, in their life cycle, living in water, but also living on land. So how could a salamander survive the eruption and uh, go on to uh, remain alive? And the solution turned out to be neoteny. Probably you've never heard of that, but this is a, a phenomenon in which sometimes salamanders retain their aquatic features. In other words, the salamanders, as they grow up in the ponds uh, into adulthood, they became, become reproducingly mature adults, but yet they still have gills and fins. And so they are obliged to stay in the water and this is called neoteny. And this obligates these salamanders to reproduce, spend their whole lives in water, and in certain instances, it uh, keeps them alive because they avoid being killed by going onto land. And so following the eruption, neotenic behavior, or neoteny, was observed in three salamander species, including the northwestern salamander that we have here. If you wonder what the others were, they were the the coastal giant salamander and coast giant salamander. But uh, here, here's a neotene. Uh, has, uh, it's a mature salamander, but it still has its gills. Uh, a biologist named Spruels in 1974 had written an article hypothesizing that neoteny may be an adaptation enabling certain salamanders to survive severe terrestrial disturbances. It's as though the salamander 
in a larval form, they somehow sense what's going on, and they're, and they're designed to make an adaptation which keeps them in the water and keeps them alive. Uh, how it works, I don't know, but that's the idea. Uh, also, in uh, 2005, Charlie Chrysofulli, the who well, I think is the most productive biologist at Mount St. Helens, he wrote, um, neoteny was an important life history characteristic for three salamander species that allowed that appears to uh, allow these species to persist or even flourish in the post-eruption landscape. Uh, and then as the forest returns um, to Mount St. Helens landscape, the importance of neoteny should diminish and metamorphism should become a more adaptive trait. So early in recovery, neoteny was a life-saving strategy for certain amphibians. But as the blast zone recovered then, Salamanders and frogs became amphibian travelers. Now, lengthy dispersals over harsh um, volcanic material would seem a daunting task for frogs and toads and salamanders. Here's some reasons why. They have a rather delicate integument. Their skin is not covered by feathers or scales or fur or something. They're, they're fairly susceptible to injury. They require a relatively cool and moist habitat, and they have very specific food requirements, and they would seem to travel fairly slowly. So uh, here's a um, western toad, and you uh, have to lay down, have to get the, the toad's level to get these photographs, but it turns out that many amphibians made remarkable, what I think are remarkable journeys at Mount St. Helens. This fellow, the western toad, um, and again here you see him camouflaged uh, against the forest floor. Dispersal distances for the western toads that were measured were one mile, 2.7 miles for another one, 3.4 miles for another one. And these numbers are based on a straight line of travel route. You know, as the crow flies, not as the toad hops. Because toads go around obstacles and so forth, and so the actual distance the toads would have traveled would be much greater than what we see here. Now, this is a um, red-legged frog in the debris avalanche uh, pond. And uh, perhaps you're wondering about the name. Its legs don't really appear red, do they? Well, here's a photo taken on one of our Clackamas River trips. I'm holding a red-legged frog. And, um, Indeed, the legs are red, you can see. Now, here's the dispersal capability of red leg frog, or a, a frog that was tracked, and from its source onto the debris avalanche was 2.2 miles. Here's our northwestern salamander again, and they made some noteworthy journeys. They traveled uh, 1.1 miles and 1.8 miles from Spirit Lake to ponds uh, on the pumice plain. Here's the champion of all amphibian dispersers, the Pacific tree frog, or sometimes called a chorus frog. But it's perched on a volcanic rock on the debris avalanche. It's a little green speck there in this vast uh, volcanic uh, landscape. Here's a little closer look at the creature. He's kind of a cute guy. And so where did these little uh, frogs disperse to? Well, here's where some of them went, into the crater. And having made that dispersal myself, I can tell you it's not an easy trip. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what was the dispersal distance? Well, six miles. And of course, it would have been much more than that, the way frogs travel. Uh, what are the factors that enable long distance dispersal? And uh, how can they accomplish these things? And here's four factors that enter into their success. Uh, first of all, uh, there's this idea of species vigility. Some you know, are just made to travel, and some are made to stay still. Uh, some species um, can move across the landscape, and uh, like the northwestern salamander, they're good dispersers, they're said to have high vigility, but we also have some salamanders that just sit still. Yeah, they're called sedentary, and they don't move much. So the good dispersers were sometimes uh, able to make good journeys. Now, um, many, or many amphibians have high reproductive capability. In other words, they produce a lot of young, so there's a lot of them die, but then there's still a lot left that can, can make it through. 
And so high reproductive capacity is important, like a western toad may lay 17,000 eggs in a single season. And sometimes those toads, uh, well, those eggs hatch, and you've got tadpoles that just blacken the shores of lakes, like this is Mita Lake, and they metamorphose into little toadlets, uh, which uh, are, can be very numerous. There was an account early in the eruptive period, uh, early after the eruption, when a researcher was walking and saw a hillside that appeared to be in motion. And it turned out the whole hillside was covered by toads. It was just population booms of these. There was no predators initially to, you know, and there was a lot of algae to eat and so forth, so they just, just mushroomed. Um, of course, most of these uh, toads, these little toadlets, died. And of course, by doing so, they uh, enriched the soil and they d had a function in even doing that. Um, now, another aspect of this is landscape permeability. And by that, we mean there's only two times during the year when amphibians can make lengthy dispersals, uh, especially over these pumice deposits. And those times are when the landscape is permeable, that is wet. So this occurs with the autumn rains and uh, with the spring snow melt and, and rain as well. And successful um, uh, dispersal, of course, does not occur in the summer heat, wouldn't occur in the winter at all. Now, also, there are some linkages uh, between um, the amphibians and other creatures, and uh, particularly these, the northern pocket gopher again. The gophers have made a network of tunnels throughout much of the blast zone, and this tunnel system is like a subway, and amphibians uh, travel through these tunnels because it's more humid in there and, and degrees cooler, and I know I've looked in a gopher tunnel and seen a western toad looking back at me on one occasion, so they, they, they get down in there. So these are just some ways in which uh, the dispersals have been made. And of course, we're interested in dispersal uh, following Noah's flood because all kinds of creatures ha would have lots of challenges in, in dispersals. Uh, well, let's go on to our last topic here. And uh, uh, there's another burrow. There we go. What's wrong with this picture? This is Mita Lake. Many of you have probably been there. It's in the blast zone, uh, about six or seven miles from the volcano. Notice the interpretive sign and the viewing platform are underwater. Why did they build them that way? <laughs> you probably figured it out. Uh, and uh, they were flooded because of an industrious animal, and here he is. At Mount St. Helens, the beaver are nocturnal and very hard to photograph, so I couldn't do any better than this. So appropriately, we're talking now about the Corps of Engineers. In contrast to the animal itself, the beaver cuttings are easy to spot. And here's a small dam on Harmony Creek uh, near Spirit Lake. So the beaver didn't survive in there. They, they returned after the plants recovered. They basically ate their way up the creeks as the plants returned along the creeks. Well, beaver now, by damming creeks, have produced new wetlands in the debris avalanche. We see that on our hikes on the, on the hummocks trail. And the wetlands produce habitat for a host of organisms that otherwise would be less common or not even there. You know, things like great blue herons and wood ducks and muskrats and red leg frogs and garter snakes and dragonflies and cattails and rushes and sedges and probably hundreds of things. Um, and so for this reason, the beaver are generally called a keystone species, which is defined as a species upon which other species in an ecosystem largely depend, such that if the keystone were removed, the ecosystem would change drastically. And let me just give you one example of how uh, the beaver uh, is a, uh, it affects uh, one group of animals. After the eruption, many small ponds formed in the low spots on the debris avalanche as is seen here. So the debris avalanche was the avalanche of or the landslide that came off Mount St. Helens, and it rests in the Toodle Valley now. And the debris avalanche is hummocky. It has mounds, as we see here. And the mounds are sort of semi-intact pieces of the top of Mount St. Helens. And then at the base of the mounds, where it's lower, often that intersects the water table or the, these areas are dammed up and isolated uh, or don't have any outflow. 
Anyways, they fill with water, and so you have just a, a large number of ponds. And then typically willows grow around the water's edge in the so-called riparian zone. Now, many amphibians, such as the northwestern salamander, they require plant stems like willow to which they can anchor their egg masses. And these are called overpositioning over sites. Uh, and uh, they uh, consist largely of woody twigs, plant material that is partially or fully submerged in water. And the amphibians can anchor their egg masses to these uh, so they don't uh, drift off into unfavorable places. Now, the debris avalanche ponds then would seem like a great place for amphibians. Uh, the problem was, and there was willow all around here, but the problem was the willow was strictly on the land and not in the water. And so enter the beaver, and by damming the outlet streams of these ponds, beaver raised water levels and flooded a lot of willow. And then this greatly increased the number of egg laying sites for amphibians such as the northwestern salamander. Here we see a, an egg mass uh, of, a, of the northwestern salamander and another one, you can just see the little embryos developing in some of these uh, eggs. Chris Foley again writes, before beaver activity, overpositioning substrates were sparse and likely limited salamander reproduction. Beavers had their most pronounced effects in the debris avalanche zone. Dams caused elevated water levels, which inundated the riparian zone, the, surround stream, the zone that surrounds the ponds. Inundated plant stems were used by over, as overpositioning sites by northwestern salamanders and so forth. Again, want more detailed information? That's the third article in Journal of Creation on amphibian responses to the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. So uh, we come to some conclusions here, and there's a lot we could say, and I'm going to keep this brief, but um, I've given you 10 examples of processes and organisms and interactions that have been observed and studied at Mount St. Helens. Uh, each is like a piece of that jigsaw puzzle. And uh, of course, there are literally hundreds, maybe thousands probably, more little stories like what I've told, uh, some of which are known and many of which are not known. But if you would know all those stories about all those organisms and all these interactions and put them all together, then you would understand why recovery is occurring. I mean, each little piece is a part of the story of recovery, even though it may seem insignificant on its own. Uh, so what are some takeaway lessons from all of this? Uh, let's go back to the three questions I posed early in the program, the first of which was, does the Mount St. Helens ecosystem show evidence that it was designed to recover from severe uh, disturbance? And the question reminds me of a statement by, I think it was an engineer, uh, who, which goes like this, uh, if something works, it didn't happen by accident. That's the uh, gist of it anyways. If something works, it doesn't, didn't happen by accident. Uh, doesn't the mere fact that this complex ecosystem at Mount St. Helens, that, that it's highly functional and can recover the way it does, doesn't that speak volumes for design? Like, again, somebody thought it through ahead of time. Uh, the ecosystem at Mount St. Helens works with precision, including when catastrophically disturbed. And again, it reminds me of another complex system, the human body, which when injured immediately begins and eventually completes the process of healing. I think there's some comparison between those two. Second question is, does recovery at Mount St. Helens help us understand global recovery following Noah's flood? And I think of great importance and interest here is the fact that the secular scientific community has come to believe that observations at Mount St. Helens do apply to other disturbances or even disturbances in general. So what we're seeing up there illustrates what usually happens when an ecosystem recovers. Here's a quote from a publication of the U.S. Forest Service, Pacific Northwest Research Station, and it uh, reads in part, um, the insight ecological research on Mount St. Helens and at other volcanoes is enabling researchers to identify universal themes in ecosystem response to disturbance. And this means that the lessons learned here can be relevant in other disturbance settings. Is it not reasonable to think that one of those other disturbance settings is the entire Earth in the aftermath 
of the global cataclysm of Noah's flood. And the last question was, do lessons learned at Mount St. Helens enable us to become better stewards of God's creation? The Bible clearly teaches that God created and thus owns the earth, but he has entrusted its management to humans. But what is needed for humans to successfully manage wildlife and forests and lakes and streams and the oceans and so forth? And I'd say what is really needed is knowledge. You got to know something about that which you're managing. And how is knowledge acquired? Well, it's by good science, uh, by studying things like uh, the Mount St. Helens ecosystem. Uh, and so good scientific investigation seems like an integral part of carrying out the dominion mandate of being able to rule over to manage the, the Earth's and its resources. Um, here are some examples, for example, uh, in relevant to the forest. It was basically a forest that was destroyed up there, and there's been a lot of things that relate to forest management, to forestry, uh, that have come out of Mount St. Helens, some of which uh, you may agree with, some of which you may not agree with, but it has had an impact on how forests are managed. And he's, these are just some of the topics, not discussing these, but these are just some topics that have come up as, as issues that relate to forest management. The importance of biological legacies in disturbance recovery, that's probably important. Like, think about after forest fires and that. The role of salvage logging, what is its role? The use of pesticides in the forest, should they always be done or not? Used, uh, they have pros and cons. Value of, value of seemingly insignificant organisms like the fungi, the pocket gophers, the beetles, the tent caterpillars, we can go on and on and on. Seemingly insignificant nuisance creatures oftentimes, but yet when you get out in the ecosystem there, they're doing something. They're doing something that seems to be important. The futility of seeding with non-native grasses to prevent erosion. There was an attempt uh, by soil conservation people to seed the blast zone with non-native plants. And it was partly done, but uh, the ecologists got so mad that it was finally stopped. And it didn't work because the seeds eroded away and the mice ate them, ate them anyway. So it was an explosion of, field of mice. Anyways, another, that's another story. But the importance of mycorrhizal fungi and phenicoid fungi, that is terribly important. Uh, how do we maintain mycorrhizal fungi, uh, you know, through uh, rotations of a, of a plantation forest, for example? Uh, better understanding of succession. Critical role of nitrogen fixation, that's important. The importance of insect controls over plant populations. The importance of recovering landscapes in maintaining biodiversity. Uh, the issue of invasive species, and we can go on and on and on. Many of these things have been uh, information has come from Mount St. Helens. Well, I think uh, enough said. I'll, uh, at this point, uh, wind up and glad to take any questions and provide answers if I have them. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. We have two roving microphones, and if you